Daily Tech News Show is made possible by you listening right now. Thank you, Reed Fischler, Larry Bailey, Michelle Sergio, and Jay Giuliano. On this episode of DTNS, the Copilot Plus PCs are here. Xreal improves the simplest of AR glasses. And you know what? Maybe being an influencer is not your path to riches after all. So sorry. This is the Daily Tech News for Tuesday, June 18th, 2024 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Animal House, I'm Sarah Lane. And I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. Hey, uh, who among us has NVIDIA stock? I, oh, I, I wish it were me, Tom. Not me. Either. Boy, do I, I have, wish it were me. I, I have Darn a fund. This. I just have a fund. Yeah, you. but you didn't. You don't hold stock. I you don't, just you I don't hold a, stock. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, NVIDIA just became the most valuable company in the world, passing Microsoft. So congratulations, Jensen Huang. And for the rest of us, uh, you can now start hating NVIDIA because everyone always hates the biggest companies in the world. Yeah. So there yeah. you go. Yeah. All right. Take, congratulations take, take to all Take it down a peg, things. NVIDIA. <laughs> uh, now the rest of the quick hits. Google expanded its Gemini chatbot app to Android in Bangladesh, India, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, and Turkey. You can now download it in the pay, uh, Play Store, turn, on, turn it on in Google Assistant, and then in iOS, toggle a switcher at the top of the Google app. Gemini now supports nine languages used in the new territories. Gemini also is coming to Google Messages starting in English. Worldwide, Gemini is available in Google Messages and all Android device devices with six gigabytes of RAM or more. Before today, it was limited to Pixel and Samsung models, so big expansion. The information sources say Apple has told suppliers it has stopped working on Apple Vision Pro 2. Instead, it's focusing on a less expensive version of the current Apple Vision Pro for release by the end of next year. Supposedly, the price of this cheaper one would be closer to $1,500 instead of the $3,500 of the current one. All the work now goes on making the device lighter as well as cheaper without sacrificing too much capability. Fisker, the California-based electric car company, has filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy and in its discussions with stakeholders regarding debtor in possession and the sale of its assets. In other words, they're selling the company for parts. Back in February, Fisker highlighted worries about staying in business and later didn't secure an investment for, from anybody, but especially a large automaker, which was alleged to have been Nissan at the time, reported by Reuters. If you need a really thin keyboard for travel, but everyone you find is too big, meet the Logitech Keys to Go 2. It's less than a centimeter thick at a third of an inch, weighs 7.8 ounces, so you can slip it right in your bag, and the keys still have 1.1 millimeters of travel and a full roll of shortcut keys for things like play, pause, volume, brightness, etc. Easy switch keys can toggle between up to three Bluetooth connections, so you can use it on multiple devices and change with just a tap. Sports Windows, Mac OS, iOS, iPad OS, Android, and Chrome OS. The downsides are no kickstand, uh, and it uses disposable coin cell batteries. Uh, you can't recharge it, but it supposedly gets 36 months of battery life, so you won't need to change those coin cell batteries very often. And it costs you 80 bucks. 36 months 36 of battery months. life. Yeah. That, that. I may not even live that long. <laughs> you never know. Yeah. Meta-owned Threads has launched an API for developers, allowing third-party apps to publish posts, fetch their own content, and deploy re uh, reply management tools that will let users hide or unhide or respond to specific replies. Developers can also tap into analytics such as number of views, likes, replies, reposts, end quotes, at the media and account level. In a post on Threads, Meta CEO Mark Zuckerberg announced that the API is now widely available and coming to more of you soon. Meta also released a reference open source app on GitHub for developers to try out. All right. The Copilot Plus PCs have launched. Mm. 
Yeah, these are PCs that are certified for Microsoft to have enough trillions of operations per second or tops, at least 40, in their neural processing units to run the co-pilot models at top performance on as many devices as possible. Right now, they're all running Qualcomm's Snapdragon X Elite processors. Copilot Plus PCs with Intel and AMD processors are expected later this year. Now, they don't have that controversial Microsoft recall feature. Microsoft has decided to keep that in insider preview while it tests those new security and privacy measures. However, there are loads of other voice and text activated measures integrated into Windows 11 on these machines, and they only work on these machines. That includes automated photo touch-ups, real-time translations and captions, image generation, graphics upscaling, and the usual text summaries and things that that Copilot does, but it does it on device with these machines. So Sarah, run us through the highlights of what's available starting now. Okay, so Acer's Swift 14 AI is a 14.5 inch display, three pounds, 26 hour battery life available in July starting at $1,100. The Asus VivoBook S15 can dim the screen when a camera detects that you aren't there and can also automatically lock and unlock the computer. That is $1,300. That seems to be the one everybody's excited about too. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, the, some the party trick, right? Uh, Dell has a few, uh, including an XPS 13, Inspiron 14, and 14 Plus, and a Latitude 5455 and 7455 for Enterprise. Pricing and availability coming later this year, although we, knew, we do know that the XPS 13 is going to start at $1,300. That seems to be kind of the sweet spot um, as far as pricing goes for a lot of the stuff. HP. HP has the Omnibook X, a 14-inch starting at $1,150. Ooh, oh, that, that, that's priced nicely. Also has the new helix-shaped HP AI PC logo. There's also the HP EliteBook Ultra G1Q. That's a business laptop that runs some of the video conferencing things like background blur on the NPU, saving you some CPU power, available now for $1,700. Let's move on to Lenovo. Lenovo has the Yoga Slim 7X with a 14-inch screen, 2.82 pounds, uh, and, you know, and thin bezels as well, starting at $1,300. Again, that sweet spot. A ThinkPad T4S Gen 6 is on the way as well. Microsoft. Surface laptop, uh, it's $1,000, promises up to 22 hours on a charge. The Microsoft Surface Pro with the new Flex keyboard works whether the keyboard is attached or not, starting at $1,000. There's a price point, right? Yeah. Yeah, right? Finally, the Samsung Galaxy Book 4 Edge series. That screen size uh, sizes range from 14 to 16 inches with 3K AMOLED screens in a 120 refre uh, hertz refresh rate, starting at $1,350. And we're also seeing benchmarks trickle in for these devices. Uh, they're all with the Snapdragon X processors. Uh, its NPU is the fastest on the market at 45 tops. It's also the only one in this class on the market, uh, at least until AMD Strix Point and Intel Lunar Lake arrive later this year. Uh, they're expected to be as fast or faster, so uh, it will only be on top for sure for a few more months. The benchmarks out there do generally show good performance and great battery life. Uh, sleep performance also seems much better at not draining the battery uh, so that, you know, you come back with only a couple of percentage points down after it being asleep. Qualcomm's Adreno GPU, on the other hand, is not delivering the graphics performance that gamers might want. It's fine for other stuff, uh, but there are ARM emulation errors. People expected that. There are also some reports in difficulty changing game resolution to match your screen, lower than expected frame rates, difficulty finding whether games are native or emulated, and PC Gamer noted that a sponsored video review of the Asus VivoBook S15, note sponsored, Asus was paying this person to review this, noted that front for, Fortnite wouldn't load uh, on the Asus VivoBook S15, and Diablo 4 ran for one minute before it had a catastrophic prism crash. Uh, so... 
probably not great for gamers, uh, but it does seem to be doing well in the benchmarks elsewhere. Roger, what do you make of day one for the Copilot Plus PCs? I mean, it is it is it is a good first step. And I think the gaming thing, to be honest, it, this is a target segment that probably isn't heavy in the gaming uh, uh, category. Uh, emulation always has its issues, but it, it will have issues specifically with games because so much uh, so many games are written with certain hardware hooks uh, that it can be difficult to emu emu uh, duplicate in emulation. But um, Microsoft is claiming, at least with the Surface laptop, it can run up to 22 hours on a charge. That's incredible for any you know uh, uh, notebook. Uh, that's that's like smartphone you know territory. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and all these. All these devices right now are targeting that thin and light ultra notebook segment, uh, the one that Intel is trying to uh, uh, shoehorn in uh, with their core ultra line. So this is definitely something that I think will uh, make Intel uh, stand up and, and take note because uh, these are the notebooks that you go to Best Buy and that's the thing you see on their countertops. Uh, you go into any kind of uh, electronic store. Those are the ones that sell because people are looking for uh, a, a device that does all the productivity, all the web surfing, all the social media uh, in a very slight, slim uh, device. And these so far uh, seem to be hitting on all those uh, uh, marks. Now, it remains to be seen because Intel and AMD still have yet to release their chips um, to see how well it stands up to uh, the next generation of uh, ultra light uh, processors from both of them. Uh, but right now it's a good start. Uh, I will stress that I do kind of wonder how long Windows will try to straddle the x86 and the ARM architecture uh, line within Windows 11 at some point. Will they try to just say, we're going to deprecate this and move over to this uh, uh, ISA exclusively? I, I think it's interesting that Qualcomm keeps showing off gaming when they when they talk about the Snapdragon, right? Like, you, I, you, what you said is perfectly reasonable. Like, these are just thin and lights. They're not really supposed to be great at gaming, but Qualcomm keeps trying to push gaming as a, as a use case, which yeah. is, I think, why a lot of these reviewers were like, yeah, it's not real good at that. Gaming has always been, uh, plus Photoshop and Premiere uh, renders, uh, kind of the benchmark of uh, how capable a system is. And so you, it's sort of needed to be in there in order to tout these are powerful machines. Uh, because if you don't, then people are just going to say... Just tout the well, battery life. Nobody's yeah. wanting to play games on these things. Not a lot, anyway. You know, casually, but I, maybe. I think but. it's because Qualcomm does have ambitions to kind of yeah. maybe replace Intel and AMD at the top of the, the Windows PC stack. It does seem to be like a lot of the issues, as you as you mentioned, with the gaming is is software. Uh, it's it's not the hardware. So, you know, the, the, these may be fixable, and that's why Qualcomm wants to be out there pushing it. All right, let's talk about Xreal. Uh, they they were kind of one of the darlings at CES this year. They make those augmented reality glasses that are pretty much just projecting an external display in the glasses. Uh, so they plug into your smartphone or other devices. People have been plugging them into Steam Decks and other stuff. And then your field of view just becomes the display of the smartphone. It's more limited than, say, a MetaQuest or an Apple Vision Pro, but it's also more practical uh, it ships with a remote control called the Beam, so that you can do some clicking and things with it. It's not terribly great, but Xreal just introduced the Beam Pro, which is basically a smartphone modified to make the best use of the Xreal display. So instead of plugging into your smartphone, you plug into the Beam Pro. The Beam Pro itself has a 6.5-inch touchscreen. It runs Android 14. Xreal has modified Android for its Nebula OS, and then you can use the touchscreen of that device, of, of the Beam Pro, as your input for when you're wearing the glasses. It can run two apps side by side, which is something your smartphone may or may not be able to do. Uh, and it is meant to run them side by side in the field of view of your glasses. So you can keep a couple things up there. It also has dual 50 megapixel cameras, not something most phones have either. Uh, that allows you to take spatial and 3D video, which of course you can watch in your X-Real glasses, but they also will work in Apple Vision Pro. Uh, it has two USB-C ports. That way you can actually charge the Beam Pro while you're using it. Uh, and 
It costs a lot less than most smartphones at 199 bucks. Uh, Sarah, X Wheel is already touted as like being right up there with Meta's Ray Ban glasses as, as being one of the best ways to make use of augmented reality so far. This at first seemed kind of silly to me, but the more I think about it, the more it makes sense. Okay, so my first question is, and I think a, a lot of people might ha have the same question is, so I need the phone, I need the the beam, and then I need the glasses? So you don't need the phone if you buy the Beam Pro, uh, right? So you, could, you can just buy X-Real glasses and plug them into your phone, right? Or sure. you can buy X-Real glasses, and X-Real glasses are like 450 bucks. You can buy X-Real glasses and buy a Beam Pro and not have to use the phone because the Beam Pro will have apps and everything on it as well. So I might just not be the right, you know, person to ask about this because I, I, I still, I got rid of my cellular connectivity for my Apple watch because I was like, I want my phone. I don't want to be without my phone. I want my phone with me at all times. Um, so, so something like this, this is not meant to replace your phone either. Understood. Yeah. Understood. But yeah, yeah. you know, how many times am I going to be like, all right, let's do some AR fun stuff around the world. But you know, phone left at home. Kind Hold of on. Think of it this way. When you put on the Apple vision pro, do you use your iPhone? No. This is basically the same thing. It's saying the beam pro becomes the computer for the X real glasses, the way the Apple Vision Pro has it in the headset. Okay. Yeah. I mean, sure. This feels like something that I wouldn't use all that much at home for myself. I would use it out and about in the world, in which case I would want my phone. <laughs> yeah. Just because, you know, emergency stuff. You know, your mileage may vary. I, I would love to know from from anybody out there listening and being like, no, this is great. And here's why. Yeah. Let us know. The um, negative but, is carrying a second thing. I get you there. Yeah. Yeah. It's the this the, this and, you know, I'm not calling out X Real specifically. The kind of like like oh, at, at some point, we're not going to have to have, you know, four devices to do the one thing that we want to do. We're going to get there. We're not there yet. Yeah. Um, so, you know, d kudos to all companies who are, you know, kind of doing that middleman stuff right now. I do think this is sort of a, like, where your perception starts is whether this makes sense or not. If you reimagine it as, Oh, for six hundred dollars, which or six hundred fifty dollars, uh, you get a set of smart glasses that you can use entirely on their own. You do have to have a little thing in your pocket, but that's the same as the Apple Vision Pro. Uh, or True. you can True. also plug it into your smartphone and use it with that. So, in other words, instead of coming from like, oh, it's meant for the smartphone, but now I have to buy another thing. Think of it as I'm buying a thing that's six hundred fifty dollars, and I can also use that thing with my smartphone. Does that change your mind about it at all? I mean, the Beam Pro starting at two hundred dollars does <laughs> a little well, bit. Well, it's six hundred fifty dollars because you have to buy the glasses for four fifty, and then the two. Right, I'm adding right. the two hundred. Yeah. So if you think about it as a unit instead of thinking about it separately, yeah, I mean, it's kind of pricey know. to be honest. But it is. It is kind of pricey. I'm probably yeah. I'm probably not going to do this. I also. I am, you know, very into AR and, you know, whatever you want to call augmented reality. Uh, there are uh, lots of uh, ways to uh, talk about it these days. Um, I'm into it. I, I, I have yet to be like, yes, these are the glasses I'm going to wear out in the world and it's going to make things better. But I think we're getting close. Yeah. Closer. And the X-Real glasses look like glasses, except for the cord coming off of them. That's really the the big negative is that they can't sure. they can't make them look like glasses and keep everything in there the way Meta does. Meta Meta uses they're a little less capable than the X-Real, but mm -hmm. they also they they have a Bluetooth connection. They're also a little thicker, you know. I think they look pretty good too. But um yeah, I I think this is you're right. This is not gonna be for everyone. Uh, but if you're into the X-Real glasses, it, it might be the kind of accessory you're like, ooh, now that I know what X-Real is good for, 
this would be better because I can it, it integrates better and I could use that side by side app thing better uh, for for certain things. Uh, you know, again, like maybe there's a productivity uh, thing here. I don't know. Yeah. Interesting. Let us know what you think. Feedback at DailyTechNewsShow.com. Every year we aim to improve DTNS and keep it the best source of understanding the tech world around us. And you are essential to that. Let us know what you love about the show, but also what you might change about it to make it even better. Take our mid-year survey available at dailytechnewsshow.com slash survey. It'll take you just a few minutes and it helps us out tremendously. That's dailytechnewsshow.com slash survey. And bye. The Wall Street Journal has a post today that social media influencers are having a little bit of a time of it. Uh, the Journal spoke to an influencer named Clint Brantley, who's been a full-time creator for three years, posting videos on TikTok, YouTube, and Twitch related to the game Fortnite. He has 400,000 followers. His posts average around 100,000 views. You know, sounds pretty good, right? His income last year was less than the medium annual pay for full-time U.S. workers in 2023. That was $58,084. That's based on Bureau of Labor Statistics data. The bigger story is that platforms aren't paying as much for popular posts. So Brantley might be one of these people who maybe felt that his job was lucrative and then now feels it is not so much. The brands are being more careful with their sponsorship deals. There's more looming issues for creators, you know, such as TikTok potentially pulling out of the U.S. in 2025. But even if TikTok is not where you make your bread and butter, or maybe it's part of where you make your bread and butter, it does sound like uh, a, a lot of influencers um, and particularly young influencers are wondering, oh, okay, so I'm just I'm just skirting by rather than, you know, raking in the dollars. I have a few quibbles with some of the conclusions that are implied by this article. Um, I do think that uh, it is not unexpected that this would happen given the fact that when influencers at all started making money, everyone was like, oh my gosh, you can make money just by posting free content? That's amazing. And now it's become, we have the right to make money by posting our free content. Uh, I, I don't think it's a shocker that, that yeah, not everybody is going to get rich. Uh, I also think that a lot of the article hinged on platforms making payments and that's one that right. the the younger generations are learning. Yeah, platforms don't do that forever. Those payments are meant to kind of bring people to the platform, but they're just they're not going to keep paying you unless it's a rev share like YouTube does with advertising. Yeah. So um, yes, good point there. Uh, YouTube said that it paid more than seventy billion dollars to creators, artists, and media companies in the past three years. Yeah, that sounds great, right? Oh, wow. YouTube just, you know, sharing the love. More than 25% of channels and the ad revenue share model now making money through it. Um, that's YouTube. TikTok's uh, $1 billion creator uh, uh, fan ran from uh, 2020 to 2023. YouTube Shorts had something similar. Instagram's Reels Play bonus program reward, were rewarded creators with fluctuating payouts. Snapchat's Spotlight Rewards program gave $1 million a day to the platform's top creators. Anyway, a lot of this stuff is uh, designed to, you know, be, you know, it's... I don't know. It, it it's almost temporary. sounds like it's, it's like, it, we're, yeah, we're, it's like Facebook Oprah did this book, too. Book they, they did it with publishing companies, not just influencers, right? They're like, yeah, we'll yeah. pay you for a while to use our platform. And then once they got you on their platform, they're like, yeah, we can't afford to do that anymore. Sorry. Totally. And, you know, as a, <laughs> I don't want to tell any, you know, creator trying to, you know, make their way in the world, like you should have known better, but you know, that you can't, I, you know, let's say that you are doing pretty well on TikTok and what if that goes away tomorrow? You know, 
now what are we talking about? What are we looking at? I don't at? know though. Like I feel like that's I I feel like that's overrated. That's 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 not as big of a deal. What happens is people go to other platforms. We we have platforms die all the time. I honestly don't think TikTok's going away, but even if it does, hmm. that won't be the reason people don't make money on the internet. It'll it'll be because they can't gain a big enough audience. I think I think what we're seeing is pretty natural when there are a few people doing the new thing that catches everybody's attention yeah. and we don't really know how it works, the brands, for, forget the platform money, but we spent way too much time talking about that, honestly. It's the brands that pay the money. All the influencers I know who actually do make money on the internet, make it from brand deals, make it from sponsorship deals. Mm -hmm. Those brands were throwing money at people because they're like, oh my God, you have a million followers? I don't know if this is gonna work, but it might. Let's throw some money at you. There weren't that many creators, so more creators made more money. As the market matures, the mm -hmm. brands start to learn, oh, you know what? When we spend on this kind of creator, it works. And we don't have to spend this much money to get the effect. And that fine tunes and more creators piling in because they all hear about it, these creators that make millions of dollars sure. means that there are fewer concentrations of money, right? Yeah, I mean, this could, <laughs> you know, you think about any way that somebody makes money. Like if I become a real estate agent... <laughs> And there are just like so many other real estate agents, you know, in my yeah. area. Uh, There's only you know, so many houses. <laughs> right. It's like, uh, okay, well, we're all going to make less money. That's just kind of how it works. Yeah. yeah. Um, and yeah, I, I, I do think that uh, there are, especially for the younger set, <laughs> not myself, um, I, I do wonder wow, you know, did you, did you not get a college degree and just, you know, went, you know, hard into TikTok? <laughs> now, I'm not saying that you need a college degree because, you know, a, a, a lot of people don't uh, these days and can be very, very uh, um, successful otherwise. But yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's not a forever thing. Never I guess was. the way I would put it is uh, this was a surprise that people could make money off of it. We figured out that there is a limit to the number of people like any celebrity driven enterprise. There are sure. a few people who can make a lot of money at it. And then a long tail of people who make a small amount of money on it. Exactly. Uh, and, yeah. and yeah. that's it's Hollywood. There are other jobs. <laughs> it's not like, you know, this yeah. is going to work out for everybody. That's just, just not the way it's going to work. All right, let's check out the mailbag. Let's do it. Connor in Sardinia writes in, I think Microsoft pushing the recall feature wasn't nefarious or misguided. Sometimes us techies forget that we're a small portion of that user base. Recall wasn't made for us. It was made for everyone. I used the Rewind app for a while. It was useful, but it's a thing with these systems. Their magic comes when you need it, and like a backup, you don't want know when you will. Microsoft enabling by default, in my opinion, was to present this magic to the users when they needed it and to avoid the situation where a friend or family member needs to find something and the resident tech support asks why they didn't enable recall. I find this at work. We implement new features, but users don't use them until forced. They need to feed the recall database data ready for users. Connor says, I compare it to screen time in the sense. It's useful, not on day one, but after a few weeks, when you look back, if it was opt out, its usefulness is diminished. Yeah, no, I, I don't disagree with anything Connor's saying, uh, but I do think that that was why a lot of people had problems with recall is like, yeah, a lot of people won't know any better and this could expose their information to nefarious people. So I, I, I do think that a lot of the sunshine that was shined on it by security researchers, not so much the overall backlash, but the people were like, yeah, actually this should be encrypted better uh, is good because you're right. A lot of people will just want the magic thing to work and won't understand that there's a risk there. Uh, also, we got a lot of really thoughtful and really good uh, responses taking issue with uh, the conversation Justin and I had about the Surgeon General wanting a warning label on social media. Uh, I thought Andy's was a really good representative one. Uh, he says, I work uh, in an emergency department in a small city uh, and another ED in a very rural area and an EMS service in a small suburban town. I don't know if mental health among youth is actually worse than it was in the past, although there are some recent studies showing it 
likely is, particularly among young girls, but I do know that we are in a crisis. Our emergency departments are filling up with preteen, teen, and young adults in mental health emergencies. Many of these patients end up spending weeks on end in emergency departments, which is definitely not therapeutic, but is also dangerous for the patients and staff. Until 2020, I worked in a large urban EMS system, and we rarely ever had mental health patients boarding in the ED for longer than a day while waiting for discharge for placement. There are many causes of this, and it is undeniably not a black and white situation with easy solutions. However, I do think that a conversation and guidelines from the government about social media can help. I saw an obvious news story for a few days ago that linked children's digital use to their parents' digital use. I suspect this is similar with social media. I have no idea if this is a useful perspective. I have no solutions proposed, but I do think a measured, full conversation on any source of mental health angst is useful. I also realize that's a pipe dream in most settings, and I couldn't resist writing in since it affects my day-to-day work life so closely. Andy. Oh, Andy. Wow. Yeah. This is great, Andy, uh, because, you know, in some of the emails I've been having with folks, the one thing we agree on is even if we disagree on the warning label or how much attribution to give social media for these problems, uh, we all agree there is a mental health emergency and that treatment of mental health is a bigger priority than social media. If social media is one of the causes, then sure. And and listen to yesterday's show from my perspective on that. Uh, But we absolutely should be prioritizing the treatment of mental health because I don't think there's any dispute that we do have a rise of that as well. Uh, and and thank you, Andy, uh, for, for writing in with this on the ground perspective about that. Indeed. And I'm, I'm as Justin and I said yesterday, we're all for guidelines, uh, no matter what, whether it's a warning label or not. The guidelines that help parents deal with social media use also very important. All right, patrons, uh, stick around. The show continues for you. We call it Good Day Internet for the second half of the hour. Netflix is opening permanent installations of its pop-up experiences in old department stores in malls. They'll include dining and merch. They're almost kind of like a theme park for Netflix, but not quite. Anyway, you want to go to Netflix house? I don't know. Maybe you do. Maybe you don't. We're going to talk about it. Stick around. (laughs) You can also catch our show live Monday through Friday at 4 p.m. Eastern, 2000 UTC. You can find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. We are going to be off tomorrow for the U.S. holiday, but we're back talking digital audio converters on Thursday with Rob DeMillo joining us. Have a great one, everyone. The DTNS family of podcasts. Helping each other understand. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>